November 9th meeting. Okay. Uh, can I get a second for that? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. We're almost done. Uh, the November 23rd meeting, um, I move to approve the minutes for that. Can I get a second? Okay. Um, John seconds, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye, okay, and that's enough with, yep, perfect. November 30th, I move to approve those minutes. Second. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for bearing with us. We just had a little housekeeping to, to get through, but welcome to anyone who's joining us on YouTube. Um, we are very happy to have you. Uh, we're excited tonight to, to learn more about the Lewisboro census information. And um, thank you so much to Norma Drummond for joining us. I will um, let her introduce herself in just a minute. I wanted to quickly share for anyone who is joining us um, on YouTube, I just want to show you our web page. This is our page on lewisboroughgov.com. Um, a really great resource is this comprehensive plan project update page. Um, here we've got a link to our 34 minute kickoff presentation, which really highlights all the ins and outs of this project and how you can get involved and stay involved. And um, there's also a working timeline here. Just a quick update on that. Um, we're gonna be posting a new version of that at some point in the near term future. Um, but right now we are about to enter round one of due diligence um, on consultants. We got some great responses back to our RFP and we're going to be entering that process. It'll have multiple rounds and um, lots of eyeballs and ears, and it'll, it'll be quite an involved process before we actually get to the point of making a recommendation to the town board. And then the town board will start their own process. Um, but just wanted to give you an update on that. We're not exactly sure what our deadline is for making that final recommendation, um, but it is gonna be later than we initially anticipated. Um, perhaps March or April, something like that. But watch this space, keep, keep tuned on our meetings, our minute note, our minutes, our agendas, and this webpage will have everything you need to know and to stay up to date on the project. Um, and this is just phase one, introductory phase of the project. Um, phase two is the community engagement phase, and we're really excited about that. That'll kick off once we have the consultant hired and on board, and that will be lots and lots and lots of interaction with you, the public, and we're really looking forward to that. So, so thanks for bearing with us in the meantime. This, this is quite the marathon. So um, we're sort of just, you know, tying our shoes. We just got across the, the starting line, you know, very early stages here. So with that, I will pause and stop sharing my screen. And, um, yeah, Norma, if you don't mind, I will let you introduce yourself. Thank you so much for being here. And we're really excited to hear everything, um, anything and everything that you'd like to share with us about the, the census and how it impacts Lewisboro and, and may impact how we think about the comprehensive plan going forward. Finally got you unmuted, wow. <laughs> So hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's always of in great interest to me to keep the census alive and to share the information. Um, I hope, Charlene, were you able to get the email out to everybody with the? Good. OK, cool. Thank you. Um, I just think this way you don't have to worry about writing down notes and stuff like that. You guys, you have the table of Lewisboro information and you can refer back to it however you wish to during the presentation. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start national, go state level, go regional level, and then focus on Westchester and, you know, where appropriate, give you highlights from, from what's going on within Lewisboro. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, so welcome to Westchester County's 2020 census data, the story of us. It's not those people anymore. This is all about us, okay? Um, that's an important message for everybody to take away. So this is all about data that came out August of this year. That's uh, the first data release, uh, you know, essentially for um, use for redistricting purposes. So it really focuses on the over 18 population. It does not, it is not all the census data. Um, I can only tell you information about who's over 18. And from that, we can extrapolate and tell you a little bit about who's under 18. But I can't tell you who's 85 and older, who's 65 and older, who's under five. None of that data is out yet. There's going to be much more detailed age and housing data that will come out next year. Um, a little bit more ethnicity data, like people's heritage, if you remember asking that question, uh, you know, answering that question. Um, there's So there's a lot more data that will be coming out next year that's going to be much, much more specific. This is really for the purposes of how do we make sure that our county legislative districts are balanced within the county or our state assembly and state senator districts. You want to make sure that each representative is essentially representing not just the same number of people, but a, a good diverse mix of people within their, their areas. So that's, an, a, a, that's really the purpose of the first data release that came out. Um, Westchester County hit the million dollar, million person mark. Uh, the county executive was very, very excited to hear this. It kind of puts him in the big boy club in terms of the counties um, here. I, and, you know, so it was really, re really amazing to us because when the 2009 estimates came out, they put us, our number for their estimate for 2010 put us higher than what we actually showed up as. So in 2019, our estimates showed we would, we were going to go lower. So we were really all pretty shocked to see that our numbers were as high as, as they are. But that, those numbers, um, not just the individual numbers, but the numbers for the county as a whole are really important because it actually being over a million people makes us eligible for certain grants that we might not be eligible for. Like um, even with the COVID funds, the CARES Act and the ARPA funds, certain amounts of pots of funding, you had to have a population of a certain amount to even be able to qualify. So that's why having certain population numbers is very important. Um, the 2020 data, an important point for everybody is 2020 data essentially becomes the baseline for the next 10 years for the Census Bureau. So the annual data from here really comes from a five-year average of the American Community Survey. And to get the American Community Survey data, they're really the entire across the entire country. They're only surveying about 300,000 households each month, and then they average that data together. So it's not in Westchester. We have found that it's really, really not accurate data. That's why the census was so important for us to get a really, really good estimate based, you know, or good numbers from. Um, so it's you know, it's definitely better data for us to work from. So you can see here, the United States total is 331 million people. Um, the United States population grew by 7.4%. Um, and this is also the, some of the data that came out was housing stock data. So the number of housing units in the nation, 140 million housing units. So the housing stock across the country um, grew by 6.7%. And of the 140 million housing units, about almost 10% of them were vacant, which we should always expect some number of unit, housing units to be vacant because there's always units in transition. There's always units um, that um, are second homes to people. Okay, even especially here in Westchester, that's one of the things that we have found. If we have residents who are spending six months of the year in Florida to get tax breaks or other reasons, and they have a home here in Westchester, wherever they had their head on April 1st and where it where they spend more than half of their year is really where they should have responded to the census. So we will always have some number of vacant units. And again, I'll go through that. Um, but here you can look, you can see New York is the fourth most populous state in the country, California, Texas, and Florida all ahead of us. Florida, not by much though, okay? We're really not that far behind Florida, but Pennsylvania is significantly farther behind us. Um, from here, I can tell you that we are the 48th largest county now in the country. 
Um, we seem to get compared a lot with Montgomery County, Maryland. So uh, it's really interesting to see how close their population is to us. They're really not that far off. So it's it, they are actually are a continue to be a, a good measure. Um, but right behind Honolulu County, Hawaii, I really like the company we keep. <laughs> So just to give you some sense. And then we take a look at the national and, and sorry, the New York state and regional data. We, I, here I give you all the counties in the, you know, the great vicinity with us, both Hudson Valley counties and Long Island and the New York city counties. Um, so the most populous county in this area is by far Brooklyn. Um, and and what, how we've ranked the municipalities on this table is by the growth between 2010 and 2020. So you see Westchester is essentially just, just ahead of the middle of the road there. Um, we keep up with the national numbers. So, you know, we're, we're right on par with what's going on nationally and statewide. Um, and even, you know, in the region, we really do, we did well. So um, our, 100, our 1 million people, our increase of, of about 55,000 people from that last census, you know, we did well. But you'll see where the changes and the significant number differences are. Um, it's, it's pretty significant where, where you're gonna see some of the changes. So some, some interesting notes, okay. Um, Westchester County's underpopulation saw the biggest decrease, okay? And, and that's why we're gonna be curious to see more distinguishable data late next year about where that age group really um, changed the most. But we saw a 2.6% decrease in New York State, or sorry, in Westchester, which is less than New York State but still pretty significant in, for Westchester. It's over 5,000 children less than we had in 2010. Now we weren't as bad as other places. As you can see, Putnam County lost 18% of their children under 18. Rockland on the other hand grew 12.8%. So um, that was a big different, you know, a big growth area for Rockland. Um, some other highlights of the regional data, okay, the county's Hispanic population grew by over 30%, where New York State saw a 15.5% increase. So we actually saw almost double what New York State saw in terms of the Hispanic population. I'm going to be honest, I don't think we grew that much as opposed to we did a better job of counting. Okay, and this is where the Hispanic population is where you're going to see a significant increase in um, Lewisboro, by the way. Um, the county's black population also grew um, with three and a half percent, where New York State actually lost almost a full percent. Uh, Orange County blew us out of the water with a 22 percent growth in their African American population. Um, and then on our housing units, the number of or the increase in our housing units was on par with New York State, where we had a 4.9% increase in housing units, but New York State had 4.7. What's interesting to note is that Manhattan County, okay, New York County, had the greatest increase of housing units, but yet saw the greatest decrease in diversity of who's living in those units. Okay, Westchester saw a really good, good diversity diverse change. Um, in fact, one of the key points, one of the key takeaways for folks about the 2020 census data is that Westchester County is no longer majority anything. We have no majority population. Anybody who thinks that we are a non-Hispanic white majority is no longer accurate. And in fact, so, so our over 18 population is now only 49.5% non-Hispanic white. But our under 18 population is only 41% non-Hispanic white. So we are even going to get more diverse as we as we move forward. Um, and so, you know, I think we're, we're starting to hear that the terms majority and minority are actually going to go away soon. Um, I think that's a, that's going to be great news for Westchester and really great news for the across the country. Um, so yeah, our growth was 5.8%. We grew by 55,000. Um, our over 18 population grew to 77.8% 7, of the population. So we saw almost a 2% growth in the over 18 population from 2010, where our under 18 de decreased. Three, major three municipalities in Westchester continue to be 
minority majority. So Port Chester and Sleepy Hollow are both Hispanic majority populations. That means more than 50% of their population identified as Hispanic. And Mount Vernon is the only municipality that identified as majority black population. Um, we do believe that the push to do a better self response is really what helped us to get more people counted, not just more people counted, but to get a better response from the people who were least likely to respond. Um, and and in, along those notes, um, or along those points, Lewisboro what had the 10th best re self response rate. So you got had 79 point 2% of your population, almost 80% of your population self-responded to the census. That means that the Census Bureau didn't collect them. That means that the people living in their own housing units responded for their own housing units, um, which is better than the Census Bureau going there because the Census Bureau, we found out, tries each address six up to six times. And after six knocking on the door, if nobody responds, and if they can't get, couldn't get a neighbor to respond, then they took an educated guess about who lived in those housing units. And our sense from the 2010 census uh, data was that they counted many housing units where nobody responded as being vacant, particularly in some of the urban areas. Um, and it's what, and it was those numbers that came out after the 2010 census, where we looked at some of the municipalities and just said, these numbers are wrong. They're, they're just too low. Um, and that's what made us at the county planning department say we could not sit back and just let the municipalities flounder with the census. We really needed to take a lead. We have never done this before. So this was, we were really in uncharted territory. And as, as many of you may know, the so census portal opened up on March 12th, 2020, just three days after COVID hit Westchester County. Um, and so it totally changed all those plans that we had done and made the whole year before the census portal opened and kind of threw many of our ideas and our census parties and, and pop-up areas and the use of tablets and stuff like that, that we had all mapped out, um, kind of threw it all out the window because suddenly we couldn't stand next to each other and we couldn't hold events and we couldn't be in the same room with each other. Um, and so it made really collecting the census data um, much more difficult for us. But you know, I'll tell you that the census effort at the county level actually started in 2018. In 2018, the county actually undertook a, a review of addresses to make sure that the Census Bureau had the best addresses that they could have. Um, and so in reviewing, because New York, Westchester County is a New York census affiliate. So we have access to census data that other people don't have access to. And so we were actually able to find 24,000 housing units that the Census Bureau did not have addresses for. Many of them were illegal apartments. And in fact, because of our, uh, my staff being sworn to confidentiality, we could not tell the local municipality about all the housing units and where they were that we found. OK, we couldn't tell Lewisboro about all the illegal accessory dwelling units that they have. I mean, I'm sure Lewisboro knows that they have a lot of accessory dwelling units, um, particularly in certain areas of the town. But we uh, we had to provide the information that what what we found to the Census Bureau. And what we did was we really started with maps of communities in 2010 and aerials and then looked to see where the development was, where are where where were the new streets? all across the county. So that, that was what started us in terms of finding all of the new developments that had occurred between 2010 and 2018. Um, and then looking to see what streets disappeared because at the same time, not just fires, but redevelopment in many, many areas, particularly if you think of some of the urban areas where they went from um, you know, two, three, four story properties and, and buildings to now 24 story buildings, um, particularly in places like New Rochelle. So it was, it was places like that where um, we helped the Census Bureau make sure they had the best addresses that we could so that we could get materials to every house and then make sure that, um, you know, then and then work with the municipalities to get a better self-response. So uh, again, better 
self-response also meant that more housing units not just were found, but were counted and were found that they were not vacant. Um, we actually had better occupancy of our housing. And then the last area that I'm going to cover really, really quickly with you tonight is group quarters information. Every single municipality in Westchester has some kind of group quarters, some number of group quarters residents. Um, so we're going, I'm going to just kind of start at the top here. I'm just trying to get something off my screen. Okay, um, let, right, let me go back. So population by municipalities. The municipal populations changed anywhere from 14.1% down to losing up to 3.8% of their population. And so if you look at the largest areas, the largest communities in Westchester, Yonkers by far, okay? Yonkers actually beat out Rochester now to now be, I think they're the third largest city in the state. Um, but they had a population of 211,000 people. Um, one of my last slides shows you the density of, of the areas and so how, what their geographic areas and how many people they have per square mile. So the cities kind of blow the, the, the towns like Lewisboro kind of out of the water with how many people they fit in per square mile. Um, so New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, White Plains, our four large cities were by far our most populous, um, have the highest populations, but they didn't see necessarily the greatest growth. OK, um, in fact, New Rochelle and White Plains saw some of the smallest growth in the county. Um, Mount Pleasant had the hardest to count census tract. And if I tell you where it was, it was grasslands. OK, the census tract where the Westchester Medical Center is and the staff housing that's there and understanding that the pandemic was in full flame at that point. I think everybody can understand why that was the hardest to count census tract. Um, and we had done specific outreach in the summer with the medical center staff to be able to encourage people who live there to respond to the census. Um, but, you know, that that was honestly became that became a great effort for us was um, ultimately they had the heart, the census tract that was hardest to count. And so ranking the municipalities, we actually saw very little change between the municipalities and, and uh, their populations and where they kind of ranked out of the 43 municipalities in the county. Um, so they're the five largest, Yonkers, New Rochelle, Mount Pleasant, sorry, Mount Vernon, White Plains, and Greenberg. But then the smallest, Ardsley and Buchanan, were 42 and 43, yet Ardsley had the greatest percent increase in people. They had that 14.1% increase. But 14.1% increase in Ardsley was only 627 people. So you see the difference in the size of our municipalities. So the, so the five municipalities that saw the largest percentage increase were Ardsley, Larchmont, Elmsford, Ossining, and Mount Vernon. Um, just really quickly to get your, Tate, your number. Um, Ards, sorry, Lewisboro was one of those municipalities that lost population. You actually had a 1.2% um, decrease in population. You had 146 fewer people this in uh, with this census than you did last time. Okay. Um, but again, this is where I show you. New Rochelle is, was the uh, third most populated area, but yet you can see they actually had, they lost um, or, or sorry, their increase put ranked them 30th out of the 43 municipalities with that only 3.5% increase. So let's jump to the Hispanic. I'm only, I, I only have like two slides on each, each of these groups just to kind of give you that really high level of what's going on in the county. The county's Hispanic population is now 269,000 people. So we saw an increase in our Hispanic population of 62,000 people. Remember I told you our overall population increased by 55,000. So in essence, the, the, the Hispanic population really, really, we got did a much, much better job of counting them. Um, so it was a 30.1% increase in the Hispanic population. So now 26.8% of the county population considers them, themselves to be Hispanic. 11 municipalities saw a greater than 50% increase in their Hispanic population. Okay. Um, and so when I look at the municipalities with the highest percentage of residents who are Hispanic. Again, Port Chester and Sleepy Hollow are the only two municipalities that are majority Hispanic. Okay, Port Chester, 65% of their residents are Hispanic. And then we have Sleepy Hollow with 52.9. 
Um, and then Austin, we, we, we actually thought Austin had a higher percentage of Hispanics. Um, so we were kind of surprised that they didn't hit that 50% level, but probably with the next census, they will. Uh, so again, uh, Austin, Peekskill and Elmsford kind of round out the top um, five municipalities in terms of percentage of, of the population that is Hispanic. So every single municipality in Westchester saw an increase in their Hispanic population. In fact, every municipality except Sleepy Hollow, who is already majority Hispanic, saw an increase over 15%. So, um, you know, so the Hispanic growth was all over the county. It wasn't in just certain areas of the county. Um, and so now 30 municipalities have a Hispanic population of over 10% of their population. And in fact, 13 of them are over 20% of their population. So the by percentage of increases or changes, the municipalities that saw the greatest increases, Somers, Ardsley, Larchmont, number four, Lewisboro with a 75.5% increase in your Hispanic population. Again, only 417 people, but still pretty significant. Um, and then Newcastle. And so again, I tell you, show you at the bottom how the cities or the larger areas from that first slide, Port Chester, which you see has the, had the highest population numbers wise and, and percentage wise of Hispanics um, actually saw was was ranked 39th in, per, in terms of their percentage and they had a 20% increase in Hispanic population. So that really shows you how significant the growth was of the Hispanic population. So the black population nationwide, by the way, the black population for the last two censuses, pretty much since 2000, the black population is moving south. There is no question, North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia saw tremendous growth since 2000 of the black population. And so um, as a whole, um, you know, the whole, the metropolitan area has actually lost black population, but Westchester continues to grow. We continue to grow. Okay. So we saw a three and a half percent increase in our black population, but because our overall county population grew by the, um, over 5%, the percentage of our population that is that now identifies as black actually drops. So we dropped from the 13.3% to 13% of the overall population. That's because we're now over a million instead of under a million people. So our county black population in 131,000, we saw an increase of over 4,400. <clears throat> the municipalities with the greatest population by percentage of their, uh, you know, of the municipality as black by far city of Mount Vernon, and then a far second place is Peekskill with 18.5% of their population. And they're one of the few municipalities that saw a decrease um, in their black population. So um, across all the municipalities, we, uh, East Chester had the greatest population, and I'll show you that in one second, with a 366.7% increase in their black population but the other municipalities ranked all across the spectrum going all the way down to a decrease of 58.5%. Um, 15 municipalities saw a greater than 10% increase in their, with their black population, 13% had a greater than 10% decrease. Um, and so overall um, 24 municipalities saw their black percentage of the total population drop. Again, like the county went, for, even though we increased in the number, our overall percentage of the population decreased from 13.3 to 13. So 24 municipalities in all saw that same anomaly happen, um, only, but yet only 19 municipalities saw a decrease in the actual numbers of black persons. So the municipalities with the greatest increases, East Chester with the 366%, again, only 814 people, but still significant. Ardsley, um, again, Ardsley was one of those municipalities that did a tremendous job of counting people. Um, and so they saw almost a hundred percent increase in their black population. Larchmont, Pelham Manor and Austin Town rounded it out. Again, uh, the, but in, well, in this case, I gave you the municipalities that had the greatest changes um, so by numbers, by actual numbers. So the city of Mount Vernon, had an 8.3% increase with over 3,000 people, uh, 3,000 
additional blacks that either moved there or were count better counted there. Um, Yonkers 2200, but White Plains and Mount Pleasant actually saw decreases in their black populations. Um, Mount Pleasant saw a 45.5% decrease in their black population. And, um, and well, Cortland has an interesting point later on that I'll, I'll get to. So we're gonna go to the Asian population next. Um, the county's Asian population increased 27% with a th increase of almost 14,000 new Asian residents. Um, so we have a total population of just shy of, of 65,000 Asian residents. Um, at, the municipalities changed anywhere from having lost six and a half percent to having increased almost 94 percent. The municipalities with the greatest percentage of their population identifying as Asian are Scarsdale, Ardsley, Greenberg, Newcastle, and Harrison. And for Lewisboro, um, you guys in 2010 had 294 Asians and 435 in 2020. So you saw an increase of 48%, um, 141. <clears throat> so the county's Asian population percentage-wise increased from 5.4% to 6.5%. Um, seven municipalities are now above 10%, five, five municipalities are below three. Um, and Yonkers had the most, saw the most increase with um, almost 13,000 residents and Buchanan had the fewest. Um, was, that's, and that's the total percentage of their total population. Not, that wasn't changed. So Buchanan with a 31 per person increase had almost a 94% increase in their Asian population. So, um, you know, when, when you're a smaller municipalities, those numbers can really change pretty dramatically. Uh, Rybrook, Larchmont, Scarsdale, and Pound Ridge round out those numbers. Um, and then, so three municipalities actually lost with their Asian population, Mount Kisco, Sleepy Hollow, and Tarrytown. Um, so Tarry Tarrytown saw the largest decrease. So I'm gonna to jump to housing units. Uh, in all the county found or has a total of 388, 963 housing units, which is an increase of almost 5% or 18,000 additional housing units since 2010. Um, across the municipalities, they changed anywhere from increasing almost 13% to a loss of one and a half percent, although we kind of question that one, per, that, that one municipality. Um, the greatest increases by percentage um, Austin Village, Somers, um, Northern Westchester, Somers, particularly in Baldwin Place, saw huge increases in their um, number of housing units. But Elmsford, Briarcliff Manor, and Portchester all saw significant changes. Uh, in Portchester, like I said, you know, 10% increase, it's over 1,000 units that, that we found there. So some of them were pretty significant jumps. The three municipalities that lost in terms of housing units. Um, Bedford lost 12 units, Pelham Village lost 19, and Pound Ridge, we're not sure where they lost 32 units. So, um, you know, sometimes you, you clear out one or two units to make room for a larger development. So um, that's, you know, one of the things we're gonna follow up with Pound Ridge about. And so to get to Lewisboro, your housing units only increased by 13. So you had a 0.3% increase in your housing units. Um, you went from 4,854 to 4,067. The, the better news for you is that the number of occupied housing units increased almost a percentage. So you went from 91.7% of your units to being occupied to 92.4% of your units being occupied. Now, what I can't tell you is whether your units are rental or ownership. I can't tell you any of that because again, that's the level of, that's not the level of information that's out yet. Um, so again, why I'm focusing on this is because the ACS or the American Community Survey data, the estimate in 2015, so about the halfway point between 2010 and 20, census uh, deliverables 
really showed that we were losing. We were on par to lose units. Um, and as much as 500 units was the decrease that we saw in 2015. So the fact that we did so much work ahead of time identifying units, illegal, and, and in a lot of cases, there's no doubt in our mind, because they were basement apartments and attic apartments and living over the garage and, and other, like I said, accessory dwelling units. Um, but the, the fact that we were on the estimated, we were estimated to actually lose housing units, and yet we increased housing units by 18,000 is pretty incredible. Um, and the number of our occupied housing units increased by over 20,000. So that's really, really good news because more, you know, um, having a high vacancy level is, is kind of a little worrisome. So our vacant housing units actually decreased by the 8.1%. The municipalities that saw the increases in their vacant units, uh, anywhere from two to 324, Briarcliff with the most, um, that, that they had saw the 324 vacant units. Uh, and then New Rochelle and Somers also some pretty significant. And some of the New Rochelle and Somers likely was because the construction was finished on the units and so the unit was habitable, but it might not have been occupied yet. So we think New Rochelle and Somers both saw some new development that the units had not yet been occupied. And we think that that had something to do with them. <clears throat> Mount Pleasant, we think the, great, the greatest part of that number, that 55, um, is actually because of some of the apartments at the Grasslands campus where the medical center is, the apartments associated with New York Medical College were vacated after COVID hit. So the college sent their students home. So on April 1st, those units were vacant. The college didn't have the information about who had been living there, even though they, you know, they weren't considered dorms, they are considered private apartments. Um, and so that's why we think Mount Pleasant has, has that increase. One interesting note, Cortland had exactly the same number of units in 2010 that they did in 2020. Like that doesn't happen. So it was actually pretty amazing to see they hit exactly the same number of units. Um, the lowest changes in vacant units, um, Peekskill two units more that were vacant, Sleepy Hollow three, you know, Mount, Mount Kisco seven more vacant units. So that really um, no great news there. <clears throat> and then group quarters. Um, group quarters are identified as college dorms. They are prisons and jails. Um, they are things like assisted living facilities, nursing homes, things of that sort. And so one thing to note is every single municipality has group quarters. Um, there's no municipality that does not have, you know, any population. There's some that are very small numbers of group quarters. As I say, that the number of group quarters ranges from over 3,500 to 14. Okay, um, and so you know, the, there's a great difference in terms of what those units are, but. We saw actually a pretty significant decrease in our group quarters population, but it was pretty much to what boils down to two things. Number one, the prisons. Okay, so if you see the areas that have the greatest numbers of group quarters, New Rochelle, Harrison, Yonkers, Mount Pleasant, and Ossining, and where those where the decreases are, Mount Pleasant and Ossining are two locations where we have prisons. Okay, the county jail at the Grasslands and Sing Sing Prison in Ossining Village. Both of the, the jails are seeing lower census counts and lower populations, irregardless of COVID. They're just, um, with some of the changes in laws, et cetera, they are seeing decreased populations. And so that's part of the change in Mount Pleasant as well as Austining. Um, Harrison had the greatest loss with a 926 person count difference, but we believe that they did not count a dorm, a college dorm in Harrison. We think the students were sent home before they had the chance to, to get them all counted. Um, and so that's the significant difference there in Harrison. Um, so gains, uh, some of the most significant gains were in Tuckahoe, Northcastle and Cortland um, on top of what we saw the 242 number increase in New Rochelle. But then the significant losses were Dobbs Ferry, Tarrytown and Briarcliff Manor. Now again, Briarcliff Manor, their loss was because Pace University closed a dorm. Um, and so we, you know, with the loss of the university, the dorm units in Briarcliff, that's what their loss was. Um, and uh, Hastings is another community that had a, one of their um, 
juvenile detention centers that closed, Abbott House closed. Um, and so that's why, you know, they saw a loss of, of food quarters. So again, every municipality has some. Um, you guys, let me tell you yours. So your group quarters population increased while you went from 32 to 56. So you actually had a 75% increase in your numbers of residents of group quarters. You had a 24 person increase in group quarters. And we actually give you the breakdown of what those group quarters are. Um, and so you have a 11 person juvenile institution. I'm sure you guys know what that might be. Um, and then you have other institution of seven units that would, none of these existed in 2010. You had other non-institutional in, in um, 32 units. That's where your 32 units was in 2010. And now you have 38 of those. So um, my, our guess is those are uh, group homes or something of that sort. So, um, but you might have a better sense of, of what those are. And so my last slide is density. It just, it just speaks to, to give you some sense of um, how many people per square mile and the significant difference there. Mount Vernon is by far our most dense area. They're 4.39 square miles. They have 16.8 or, or 16,821 people per square mile, okay? As opposed to your neighbor Pound Ridge is the least dense community with only 228 people per square mile. All right, Pound Ridge is 22.31 square miles. I'd actually have to pull out the sheet to see where, um, where you guys rank with that. But our most dense communities, Mount Vernon, Port Chester, Tuckahoe, and Yonkers. Tuckahoe and Mount Vernon actually are the only, it's one of the few ones that um, outranked each other. Uh, Yonkers ranked third last time around, but now Tuckahoe grew with their population so that they actually outrank Yonkers. So again, the idea is to give you an overview of census countywide um, so you can see really what's going on. And then again, balancing that with your numbers, um, I expect a lot more data next year. If you guys remember when the housing needs assessment came out, one of the, I think you guys were by far the community that saw the greatest population increase in your over 85 population. I expect that's likely going to continue that your older population is going to grow. Um, and, you know, I, you know, like your, your, your school children and your under 18 population, I'd be curious to see how those numbers kind of shake out for you guys. So um, we're, we're looking forward to seeing that additional data next year. So questions? Norma, can I can I share the PDF document that can I share my screen? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just put that up on the screen for anybody um, viewing at home that wanted to see those numbers you referenced. Sure. And if you want, I can always send you what the actually the PowerPoint that I had, and you're welcome to post that as well. So that folks. Okay. Can... Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, go ahead, Larry. You had a question. Yeah, Norma, I have a question on how the counts are done. Um, you were talking a lot about the vacant units and I know like in Lewisboro in particular and a lot of the Westchester um, municipalities and towns, there's a lot of second homes and there's also some large like um, state homes that might be gated. Um, so where do those like fit in as far as like, like a second home, I guess, if they don't respond and they try knocking on the door six times, um, do they just assume that's a vacant with a census assume that's a vacant unit? We're, we're, we're again, we're not sure. It's a determination by the, I actually, one of my staff actually was a census taker this time around. So we were able to get firsthand knowledge about what he saw. Um, but he, and so what he was said was that every time he would go out, he would make notes about what he saw. Okay. If there were bicycles in the yard, if there was, um, you know, things hanging up outside, he would make a note of what he saw and any age groups that were kind of affiliated with it, like a, like a, a little bicycle or a larger bicycle or things of that sort. And so he said, ultimately, he understood that a supervisor would make the determination of who, how many people to count in those 
situations. Um, but they were allowed to go and ask neighbors uh, you know, and uh, superintendents of buildings and others, do you know who lives there? Do you know how many people live there? That sort of thing. So um, again, people, places that where we have people with better access to the internet, more people with access to the internet and better educated people were more likely to respond. That's why you guys had a really, really good response rate, um, you know, county as opposed to some of the areas countywide. Um, so I think that's why we, we got a better job of counting done in your, in your community. What about the, like for, um, like for a gated, like a state where there might be a main house and an accessory unit or two on the property? Um, so each somebody... unit would get its own material. So if there's a gatehouse, if there's, um, an accessory apartment, and even, you know, I don't know that you have horse farms like North Salem has quite a um, they actually treat the staff quarters there as group quarters. So that's one of the things that we found out was the laborers, so the trainers and others who had a like a kind of a, for lack of a better word, bunkhouse. Okay. Um, they, the staff quarters, though, that was actually treated as a group quarters. Okay. Um, as far as um, on a kind of another line of questioning that I have. Um, uh, in Lewisboro, uh, among the people on the steering committee, uh, we have many conversations about uh, the different hamlets in town. Is, is Lewisboro um, broken up into different census tracts or is it all one big um, uh, mass of data, one, one data set or are there separate data sets by like smaller census tracts? Yeah, there are definitely smaller there. Are, we could we could break down the data for you by your census tracts so that you'll have a better sense um, and then give you kind of pair it up with a geographic map so that you'd have a better sense. I don't know that you I'd have to look and see if you have actually any specific what we call census designated places or CDPs. Um, you might like South Salem. Um, Vista, they might count them. I'd, I'd have to actually go look. There's just too many of them in the county for me to know the entire county about that. And I, and I don't use that level of data, you know, um, for every, but like this time around, we had the Census Bureau add Millwood as a census designated place. They always, they had Chappaqua in there for Newcastle, but we actually had them add Millwood because there's enough people that live in that area that in the town kind of recognize that as a separate hamlet. So we too did, you know, we did try to incorporate as many separate of the hamlets as we could. I have one more. Um, sure. You also referenced the, uh, I think it's the American Community Survey. So that's like a, another set of data um, that's expected to come out next year. Will will that information include um, like the, what, you're sh what we show, have up on the screen shows um, demographics doesn't really show the ages so much. Will there be a breakdown in like ages and household sizes and employment and um, like commuting um, information if people are commuting to work or not? What, what type of information will, what should we expect to come out next year? I know okay, that's so, kind of a basic question, but. No, um, that's fine. I, I'm actually, it's a great question. Okay, because there's, there's a significant difference between the 2020 census and the decennial census and what it collects and the ACS data. So the decennial census actually asks, usually asks 10 questions, but this time around it asked nine questions because it was not allowed to ask whether you were a citizen or not. Okay, so it asked nine questions. Um, it pretty much asked, the age of who was living there, whether you owned or rented your home, your um, whether you what your race was, what your ethnicity was, um, your you know had asked your address. Um, so you know there were only nine questions that they asked, and so from that we we're going to get a certain amount of data. But that the decennial census is the only mandatory census that the Census Bureau conducts of everybody. Okay. But as I said earlier, the American Community Survey, every single month, they are interviewing and asking not nine questions, but they're asking about 65 questions of about 300,000 households. It's actually 295,000 households 
every single month. And but so what, what they do though is they aggregate up that data and then they average it out for a five year period because over the course of five years, they get a pretty good summary, pretty good, not, not completely accurate, but pretty good summary of the local places. The deeper down that you take that data, the closer to the ground you take it, the less accurate it is, okay? Um, so like a, for a municipality like Buchanan, our smallest municipality, it's not very accurate data. Um, it, in many cases, the margin of error is actually greater than the actual number that they give us sometimes. So that's why we can tell it's not great data. Um, but, but what the dilemma that they ran into this time around was because they were conducting the ACS, the American Community Survey, at the same time that they were doing census 2020, people got totally confused, which census were they filling out? So, you know, so imagine those 300,000 households in March, in April, in May, June, July, August, September, and October were, were kept, you know, they were saying, but I already did the census or I did, you know, and, and then they would get the ACS. So what they actually said, the ACS for 2020, it's so bad that they're not even releasing the ACS data with that average in it. They're actually gonna wait till next year to release ACS data. But they ask so, so many more questions. And that's where you get commuting information and you get you know, the jobs and income information. None of that gets asked in the 10 year census, in the decennial census. If you remember back in 2000, those of us who go back that far, um, we actually used to have a long form census. So every one in every 10 households got that long form census. And that would actually inform the Census Bureau on a lot more data numbers and data statistics um, for about 10% of the population. Uh, but yeah, they stopped doing that with 2010 when they started with the ACS. And so ACS data will continue to come out every year and usually comes out every year with that five year updated average. Um, but like I said, for this year, they've already said they're just not releasing new data. The data was so bad with the 2020. So. So, but next year's data release of the 2020 data should tell us how many children were under 18, how many children were under five, how many people were, were 18 to 25 and eight were, and, and then 21 to, tw to, sorry, um, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49. You know what I mean? It gives us that much more data. So we'll know who's over 65, who's over 85, though, you know, a bunch of different data sets it will give us with the newer data. Charlene? Norma, um, it's going to come out next year, this uh, additional information. When? Around what time? We, we have no idea. They're not really? saying yet. Whoa. Yeah, they're not saying. Um, this data, the, the data that came out on August 12th by, technically by statute, it should have been out April 30th, um, but they then at one point they, it got delayed and they said it was going to be out by September 30th and it got released August 12th. Mm -hmm. So they're not, right now they're not giving us an estimate, but at some point early in the year, we expect that they'll at least give us a hint as to when it will come out. But it It'll be one big drop. That's our sense, Charlene, is that it's going to be, and believe me, when this data dump happened, the <laughs> number of people and municipalities and, and agencies that were all trying to get their data out of the same data source, people's computers were crashing. It was just amazing how many people were trying to pull the data down. Um, so I have some very, very patient census planners on my staff who just live for this sort of stuff and spent hours and hours putting together tables, as you can imagine, for 43 municipalities and then putting together tables to rank all the municipalities with all of the different data sets, uh, you know, of pretty much what the highlights that I gave you. One more question. Um, what is Lewisboro's density, density in rank, if you have it? I will, I should have it here. You can send it and I'll distribute it. Yeah, if I can't, yeah. if that, I that can't put my hands on it, then I, I'll, I yeah. will get it to you and let you, actually, because I do, I actually have a, I do know I have it by email as well. So I sh I'll be able to send it to you. Terrific, thank you. But, you know, just to give you some sense, these are all, well, it's hard to see, but these are all the data tables 
that informed me on that slide, you know, the presentation. So there's, there's a lot of data here that I shrunk into all those slides. Thank you. It's a really good presentation. It's really amazing to see how it all comes together and how we all compare it against each other. Um, you know, who has, you know, where the Asian population is and, and where the Hispanic population, it's just really, you, you kind of like scratch your head sometimes and say, why there, you know? So it's really, really interesting to see then the growth of how things change from, you know, one, one census to the next. I mean, Westchester as a whole was developed growth from New York City and growth from the Hudson River. That is really historically how Westchester County developed. So the northeastern part of the county, places like Lewisburg, are the least dense because you're the last places to be developed, really. Um, and so you have the least amount of infrastructure as well. You don't have the, the sewers in place that other, you know, you don't have public transportation that other places have. You know, so, you know, if you think of those growth patterns, now the redevelopment along those same corridors, you know, where, where we're going, growing vertically instead of sprawling out, um, that's why those urban centers are continuing to grow. Any other questions for Norma? So I'm curious, so with the growth is, do we know where they're coming from? So we're going to get, again, we'll get some of that next year, because one of the questions that you got asked in the census was, what is your heritage? What we're going to be curious about is what that looks like, because I have eight brothers and sisters, and I can tell you, we have the same parents, but we gave eight different answers, <laughs> you know, nine different answers. Sorry, because I had a, even, even a different answer than what some of my brothers and sisters. I mean, some of us put American and Italian and Irish and others just put Italian. And some, uh, you know, it was just we were all over the place in terms of how people responded to that same question. So we're going to be really curious to see. But usually we, you know, the Census Bureau is pretty good with giving us um, country of origin for those folks who were not, are not native born. Um, so yeah, and, you know, and some of the data that we have already informs us to some extent. Uh, um, so, you know, the fact that our Hispanic population grew by 62,000 and there are specific countries that qualify you as being Hispanic or as being black or as being any of the other categories. Um, so that helps us to some extent, but again, I think next year we're going to get better data on that as well. In terms of um, just migration from New York City or other New York counties or neighboring states, is there any data around that? Um, so actually the better source for where people moving into Westchester are coming from actually comes from the IRS. Because what the IRS does is they collect your zip code of where you filed from one year to where you filed the next year. And so we can actually get annual migration data from the IRS just based on the zip code of your filings. Again, I have people that love dealing with data. And so <laughs> they, they will track down sources of data that you or I would be like, like really that exists. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I know that's how we track migration data is based on um, IRS uh, tax return filings. Cool. Yep. And so, yeah, that we, I, we expect after COVID hit, so many people moved out of New York and into the Hudson Valley um, because they just wanted to get out of the larger scale apartment buildings where you couldn't even go and dump your garbage without worrying about, you know, touching something or being exposed to COVID. They just wanted to get out and have a backyard. Um, and particularly places along the train line, train lines grew, you know, those houses, any vacant houses in the Hudson Valley sold extremely quickly. And as many of us know, the prices just went through, skyrocketed, just went through the roof. Norma, do you expect that um, that based on when the census was taken, that some of that migration, uh, particularly from Manhattan to Westchester County and other suburban areas, is going is not going to be um, 
Reflected. It's not going to be captured. It should not be because, again, it's you were supposed to respond to the census based on your residency on April 1st. Okay. So we, we didn't really see that growth happening until May, June, July. It was really the summertime. So um, it was not as early as many people responding, you know, a lot, a lot of people respond way. So. Well, we have five more minutes for you on the agenda, Norma. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. If you just have any lingering thoughts or um, anything you want to add, um, but we really appreciate your time and for, for giving us this information. Thank you so, so much. Oh, it looks like she's frozen. Okay, well, we will have to write her an email saying how much we appreciate it. Um, her sharing. Let's see if she comes back. Okay. Okay, you're back. Thank you, Norma. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. All of a sudden, everybody was frozen. I was like, uh oh, I lost them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were just saying thank you so much. We have a few more minutes if you have any closing thoughts or things that you wanted to share that you didn't get a chance. So my own thing, thank you for having me first off, because the more we can keep census alive, the easier all of our jobs is going to be in 2030. The more people understand why the census data, why it's important for them to respond, it's just going to make it so much easier for everybody if they understand why it's important and how the data gets used it will help them see it's harmless. It's not, you know, it's not intrusive and it's, you know, it, it's important for me to respond and maybe it'll make it easier for whoever the commissioner of planning is in 2030. It's not going to be me. <laughs> Charlene, you're- well, Are you uh, sure you're, that? <laughs> actually, you know what I've said? Cause I'm probably gonna be retiring next year. Um, I have actually said, I'm gonna, I wanna work for the Census Bureau for 2030. <laughs> I would, I'd, I'd, really, I'd love to cover, it doesn't work. <laughs> I'd love to cover the entire Hudson Valley because I think there's you know more greater potential in the whole, whole Hudson Valley. And they were some great people that we worked with, but I was really not super impressed with some of what they did. So I want to work for the Census Bureau. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you again. We really appreciate it. And um we'll follow up um We'll, we'll try to get this presentation and the, the chart for Lewisboro posted on our website um, and maybe the density numbers and any other um, of the data that is, is available for you to share. And if there's, you know, if anything else that you guys need, just give us a shout, you know how to reach us. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. So we're going to continue moving on. Um, just stop sharing that. Oh, I'm not sharing. That's why. Okay. We're going to move on with our agenda. Can you guys see that on the screen? Okay. Let me try it one more time. Okay. How about now? Yeah. Okay. So we've just got a few um, quick topics to cover. Um, the first is um, just following up on some nuances of the due diligence process. Um, just wanted to have a discussion and agree on where we will fit checking professional references for the consulting firms into the actual timeline. So I wanna kick it to Charlene first, just cause she's seen this in action a bunch of times. Um, your thoughts on that, Charlene, would be great. I don't think, I think that we should do it somewhere when we have like, when we rank them. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's been some discussions that it's very important to talk to the people who um, work with them and who did the plan. But I think first we should rank them and then decide, you know, who are we going to call? And what's important because we maybe that we throw one out 
and it just be you know less because usually due diligence in the due diligence checking professional references is the last thing you do prior to. Uh, I think we can make some inquiries on our own uh, in some of the cases because they've worked for communities that we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know, so it doesn't have to be so um, formal. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought. Got it. Okay. Other thoughts? So I let me rephrase that. Anyone have any different feelings? No, I think that's, I think that's about right. Okay. So then just to make sure I heard that right. Um, we can slot sort of informal reference checking in at the end of round one before we move into round two. And, um, and we'll leave it open to decide if we're gonna be doing more formal, whatever that really means. I mean, if we can informally get in touch with communities they've worked with and just have a quick chat, I think that will definitely serve the purpose. Um, and, and for those others, you know, when we get to the last uh, round of it, uh, see what we want to do. I mean, mm -hmm. leave that open for now. Yeah. Um, next topic is the structure of round two interviews. So purely just um, thinking logistics, you know, the length, the length of interviews um, and the number of times that we conduct those interviews. So let's just say for argument's sake that we're going to be interviewing all five um, respondents. Um, you know, would we do an hour for each of them um, twice or once or, you know, how, how do we sort of make this fit? Um, and then also, how do we do that efficiently? Um, one idea is to have a very, um, a very strict moderator structure where someone leads the meeting and we decide on the questions we're going to ask ahead of time so that you know it's just boom 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 things get asked really quickly and there's as much time for the interviewee to respond as possible um just throwing that out there as a topic if anybody has any specific thoughts or um or recommendations i mean i've, I've looked through a couple of them and each of them are going to have teams of five six or more people so right. the question is you know do we interview the leader do we get their whole team in there scheduling their whole team might be an issue Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are some of the things we're going to deal with. Yeah. Actually, I would like to meet their whole team. I, I, I think that that's very important to the integrity of the process. And since it's by Zoom, I think it's going to be easier if we can accommodate them somewhat. Um, I think an hour would be good. I like the moderator uh, structure. And then, you know, an hour and maybe we'll make 45 minutes of, uh, of dialogue or, you know, questions and stuff, not that much, and see if anybody has any um, answers. And the second round would be 45 minutes, you know, for follow-up. Mm -hmm. So the first hour could be moderator, these are the questions, thank you very much. And then if we bring them back, unless if somebody has something pressing. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the resumes in there, some of them are uh, have have the right resumes for our town. One of them I noticed was a specialist in parking, which is not a biggie for us. <laughs> right. Right. I, I you know, I, I think it would work one hour with moderator and the second uh, free for all. You know, just with questions, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm just writing that down so that I don't forget what you said, but please, anyone else jump in. Okay, there's no one, um, any objections to that? I mean, obviously this isn't set in stone, but as sort of like a starting point. Um, 
Yeah, and, good question. So, you know, a number of these are towns that are completed and stuff. It'd be probably useful to just talk to somebody who was the head of the planning in that town and say, so what do you think? <laughs> mm -hmm. Was it effective, that kind of thing? Yeah. I, I, you know, I can have some contacts with the towns and either give it to, to Katie or talk to them myself or give it out to the committee and they can talk to them. And I ask whether, in fact, they would talk to us. Yeah, because yeah, that's probably among the best feedback is if they were happy with the job or where they work. Yeah, like a very informal, like, what do you think? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have two that work for Lewisboro. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so that's going to be fairly easy. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the other towns, but I remember knowing somebody there. So... Yeah, there are, or Norma uh, could put us in touch with them too. Nor Norma would be a, a an extreme help in that. Cool. Yeah, I think the, the first two I read have done a number of towns in Westchester. One of them, yeah. one of them uh, has done all over the state. Um, yeah, I actually, I think the responses we got were from really good firms. Yeah, yeah, we I, definitely I, have I, our work cut out for us. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, I think they're. And they made a, a concerted effort to answer the RFP. Yeah. So um, scheduling, um, I'm, ta I'm taking the lead on that. I know we have um, we have our next check-in meeting on December 14th, and then we have our dates in January um, that we're holding for the for the closed session round one discussions. Um, I'm also. Um, working with um, with the planning board to, you know, I'll, I'll try to get more dates on, in January, February, um, nailed down as soon as possible. Um, but just if everybody just keeps an eye on their emails and keeps responding the way you've been doing, thank you so much. We'll just nail the dates down. Um, at some point, we will reach out to the respondents and say, Please save the dates for these interviews. Um, Charlene, do you think we can get away? Let's just say like the end of December, we have the dates nailed down with the planning board and we can say, please save the following dates in January, February for interviews. You might not need to be on all of them or any of them, but just save the date. Is that something we can do? To the I, yeah, I think we can sort of open it up and say, these are the dates that we're thinking about interviewing um, and just leave it at that. I, I think if we can get in contact with the, um, the, the people who answered, the firms who answered and say, hey, we got, we got your um, uh, application and your submit submittal, and we're in the process of reviewing it. I think that would be helpful because otherwise, then uh, Kristen will start getting uh, you know a number of emails, and we'll you know. She already did that. She's on right. the ball. Yeah, so they all know that we're reviewing, right. and they right. also know that we likely won't be reaching out to them again until after the January right. first. It's it's good to keep them somewhat interested, so they don't really sort of forget about us, or they don't stop you know start bothering our lives right <laughs> yeah so okay so we definitely have a lot of moving parts but um but I think we're definitely all on the same page about how we're going to do it and um and now's where the rubber hits the road and we're just gonna gonna go for it <laughs> um okay so we're a little ahead of schedule I Yep, and it's just committee members on tonight, so we don't need that part of the agenda. Um, does anybody have any um, questions or closing thoughts about open action items or next meeting dates or anything like that? Nope. Okay. Okay, everybody. Well, then we will give you your 15 minutes back. Um, I know we all have a lot of reading and other work to do on these RFPs coming up soon. So even an extra 15 minutes can, can be put to good use. <laughs> so um, I'll move to adjourn the meeting.
Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much to anyone who's still listening on YouTube. We really appreciate your being here with us and please continue to stay involved. We, we're really happy to see it. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye.